Hello, everybody, and welcome to Books in Hindsight. I'm your host, author Matthew Hines. Today on Books in Hindsight, we have the lovely Julie Broad from Book Launchers. We're going to be talking to Julie in just a minute, but before we do, please hit that subscribe button wherever you are and consider a sponsorship at patreon.com slash hindsight for just a few dollars a month or go to hindsight.com that's h-e-i-n-e-s-s-i-g-h-t dot com and pick up one of my great books or pick up one of the books by one of our featured authors in the featured authors section okay without further ado let's go to the phone Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Books in Hindsight. Today, as I told you earlier, we have Julie Broad. Julie Broad is a YouTube personality, if you haven't seen her before, and she is also the CEO of Book Launchers and the author of, and I want to make sure I get this right... Uh, we're going to talk today about um, the the new brand you, and we're also going to talk about your uh, first book just a little bit more than cash flow. Sure. So before we get started talking about those, um, I just want to encourage people to go to Julie's website. It's booklaunchers.com. That is her um, company website, and Julie can tell us the website where you can get her books and also her books are available at hindsight.com i put in the links to amazon Great. so julie broad you're beautiful and you're canadian so <laughs> tell us what's it all about eh? <laughs> i don't even think i say a very often but uh, <laughs> that's <hysterical>. fine <laughs> it is there are some canadians who do say it a lot so i get it uh yeah so uh thank you for having me and uh the, the books as you said you can get them at your website so that's great um they're also available in pretty much every online anyways pretty much everywhere um and if you're in canada they're available in bookstores and uh and online and i am canadian originally but i live in los angeles now <laughs> All right, but, you know, I'm sure that people pick up on that accent or those good Canadian looks and they saw you. You can't possibly be from around here. <laughs> I don't know. I live in Los Angeles. I'm pretty average. <laughs> and, and, yeah, I'm sure. Okay, so uh, the first thing I want to say is how is the baby? You know, I when we were talking earlier, I, I was actually watching, I think, an older video. Your son is two years old now or something yeah he's not quite two but yeah the, some of the videos from last year he was a he was just in my arms as a baby we had to film we had to do our video shoots with him on site so yeah he he participated in some of them but yeah he's great thanks for asking all right well that's excellent so let's get down to business here so we're talking about um the new brand you and what we're talking about here is we are talking about um branding but before we talk about branding, Julie, tell us why Julie Broad. What 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 experience do you have that you can bring to the table and uh, and teach people about uh, branding? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a real estate investor by background originally, which is always funny because people are like, "You're in book publishing now," <laughs> but uh, you know, life is never a straight line. Uh, so yeah, real estate investing is really um, where I spent. 15 years almost, which is why my first book is called More Than Cashflow and it's a real estate investing book. 
And what happened was uh, I was building two companies at the time um, with my husband. One was a real estate trading and education company, and the other was a real estate investment company. And for the real estate investment company in particular, we were raising money to buy houses. Uh, and we were buying a house a month for a while there and renovating them. So this was a fairly capital intensive thing. You know, most of the houses we were buying were $300,000 and the renos were sixty dollars to $80,000 in reno costs. Um, and uh, banks don't like real estate investors, even <laughs> maybe a little bit before 2008, but post 2008, you know, real estate investors and banks don't really mesh. So we had to raise the capital to do this. Uh, so um, part of what we did, not only to attract clients into our training company, but um, you know, to attract people to invest with us was build a brand because neither my husband nor myself were comfortable cold calling. Um, you know, I'm I'm a high introvert. My husband has introvert introverted tendencies, I'll say. Uh, and yeah, in order to raise millions and millions of dollars, which is what we needed to do what we were doing, uh, we just really found it was easier to get people coming to us, and that was really building a brand. So my branding expertise isn't what you would typically see when people say brand, like they think of Kellogg's or you know, like you know those brand, you know Campbell's soup, those kind of. Brands. I think of cows and hot irons myself. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I'm old school. Yeah. So there you go. Um, but yeah, so it's it's a lot of people think of brands as that, but for me, branding was really about becoming the expert people know and trust. And, and so my second book, The New Brand You, was really building on uh, our real estate experience. So while it's not a real estate book, I drew from what we did to raise you know, the money that we raised for our properties. And, and ultimately, I ended up helping a lot of other real estate investors uh, with their branding. And, and a lot of them are now the leaders in Canadian real estate. Uh, and, and you know, they've kind of taken over where, where when I left, they've taken over where we left off and they've grown from there, which is really, really cool. Okay, so let me follow up by just throwing out this subtitle of the new brand you and that is, and this is really an attractive subtitle that makes me interested right away. Then uh, your new image makes the sale for you. Uh -huh. So basically, um, and what a wonderful concept that is, is that if people just looked at your uh, brand like an apple or whatever, they could immediately make a decision to buy your product. How do you establish that? Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's not it's not fast, and that's the thing. Is a lot of people in this age are looking for the quick solution, and to do this, it is not an overnight thing. Um, it is a consistent, you know, to, for people to make the sale for you, which is basically them calling you up. And in my case, it was either signing up for one of our courses, our workshops, or a mastermind that we were holding, or they were calling us up saying, "I have two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Can I invest it with you?" Um, that's you know, that's your image making the sale for you because they're calling you asking you, "Can I?" instead of going, yeah, tell me about what you do, right? You know, it's a totally different conversation. But for that to happen, it's not like, it's not a perfect website, you know, it's not a perfect tweet. It's none of that, it's, it's consistency over time. Uh, and that's the part that I think people find painful because what happens is, and we'll take YouTube as an example, because you mentioned, you know, I'm, I, I love YouTube, I'm really big into it. Growing our channel, um, this is my second channel that I'm growing. Uh, my first channel I sold, which is something people might not think about is, your, you know, you build an audience and there's value in it. So I sold off that channel, um, but I'm building a new channel. But it, when you first start posting, nobody's watching and you just have to keep going and be consistent and, and, you know, be consistent in your message, be consistent in your content, be consistent in how often you're doing it. And that's really part of branding and, and really getting it out there. So yeah, I mean, long answer to say that it's not overnight, but once you get to that point where people can kind of recognize you and they, they trust you because they've seen you over time, then that then they're calling you and that conversation's different. It's, hey, listen, I want to work with you. And then it's you deciding if they're a fit for what you offer, if they're a fit for you know who you want to work with. Yeah, and what it seems to me uh, to be is just it's a, it's a matter of education. It's a matter of over time you get people familiar with your product <clears throat> excuse me and hopefully they have favorable views of it sure. so um oh, can, now looking into um the new brand you you have anecdotes there are um sayings from grandma broad and uh there are specific anecdotes that you take from your real estate investing and um and from your personal life but in order to develop a brand in, in the new brand, you do you have 
I mean, like in education, you have first grade, second grade, third grade, and then you have to learn certain curricula. Um, do you recommend uh, a certain process for developing a brand? And not really. I think the first thing is you have to get clear on who you are. And that's, you know, I think something that some people are almost, they're too diluted. You know, they're trying to be everything to everyone. And, you know, you mentioned that, you know, hopefully most people like what you see. And I think, well, actually, I kind of don't want that. I want the right people to like what they see and everyone else I'm going to have to not worry about. And in fact, there's going to be people, if you're doing it right, there's going to be people who completely disagree with what you're saying. And that's okay. Because if you have everybody agreeing with you, then you're going to be vanilla and nobody's going to care. Um, and, and I'm not saying like say something controversial for the sake of saying something controversial, but it's kind of the same thing. When we work with clients to write their book, we're trying to figure out, okay, what makes you just that little bit different? And often, you know, there's kind of a couple ways to figure this out. And, you know, it applies to books as much as your brand, which is you got to think about, okay, what do you say that is a little different than everybody else? Or you can turn it around and you can go, what is most commonly held belief in your industry that you actually don't agree with? And that's a good starting place. And just to give you an example for more than cash flow, one of the things everybody always talked about was how real estate was passive income. And this drove me bonkers because, you know, I, I think for a select number of people, for example, the investors who gave their money to us, so we would actively manage it. Yes, for them, it's relatively passive. Um, but for the people who actually buy the properties, you know, we had a property manager rob rent money from us. That, that was because we thought it was passive. We were not staying on top of things, you know, and the list is long. So think about that. Think about something that's a commonly held belief that you disagree with. Okay, so let's talk about passive income for a second, because maybe there are people who don't understand what that is. And I, I want to know what the connection is between people thinking that they're investing in real estate as a passive income. Is it not passive just because it's so involved and that it's actually a full-time job? Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, passive income is something that happens on a recurring basis that you don't have to do anything to cause it happen, right? So, you know, dividend income, for example, you buy a stock once and then on a quarterly basis or an annual basis, whatever they're doing, the dividend is paid out, period. Right. You do nothing. You've, you've done the work. Um, and, you know, sure, you got to file taxes and stuff. So that's passive income. Um, books later on are largely passive income. You know, my, I get a check every month for the sale of my books and I do pretty much nothing um, to actively promote them. I'm focused on promoting my new business. So there's there's things like that that are that are passive income. Now, I've lost the question, <laughs> which is what happens. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to know, I, first of all, you I, you basically, you know, give us a definition of for what passive income was. But I was just trying to get at, do people get into real estate investing and then realize, oh, my gosh, this is so much work. This isn't passive. I've got to take care of this every single day. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're talking about? A little bit. I mean, I, for us, like we thought if you hired a property manager, it would become passive because somebody else is managing it. Um, but the reality was we still had to manage the property manager and you still have to oversee it. It's not a full-time job and that was never my point. Um, you know, we had a lot of properties and it still wasn't a full-time job. That's largely why, you know, part of the reason we ended up in Los Angeles, you know, long story short, but my husband had a lot of spare time, got into acting <laughs> and that's ultimately how we got to um, Los Angeles. But it, it's not a full-time job, but if you think of it as passive, you can let yourself kind of kick back when you should be actively involved in asking questions. Right. And probably you could make some very big mistakes about that. So let's switch from real estate investing and let's talk about uh, building a brand as an author. Um, is this going to be because I keep saying, oh, this is going to be my passive income, but it seems to be it, it's my whole life. So let's talk about building a brand as an author. Can you give uh, and I can think of very few people who wouldn't be able to or, or could or were less qualified than you to uh, give advice about this because you're into YouTube videos. You have your own uh, book launchers company and you write your own books. So um, what uh, what was your was were the books a passive income? What were the books about? Um, the first book was the real estate book. Um, and then the second book was the, the personal branding book, ultimately. Uh -huh. um, 
so that's what that's what they were about. Is that kind of what, is that what you're asking? No, I want to know what the what the purpose of the, of the book was. Was that Perfect. just okay? We're making money here, but uh, maybe it's a, like a how to. Um, right. Maybe it's a way to uh, guide people to uh, towards you if they need your services or something like that. So, and let's just go back to your first book, and that is called uh, More Than Cash Flow. And um, Scott, I, I just go ahead and and. Uh, and fill us in there. Um, what uh, what was the the purpose of the book? Was it um, just to be like a supplement to your income, or was it to show people how to basically do business with you? Actually, when I wrote that book, I kind of did something that I tell clients not to do, and that is, I wrote the book for the sole purpose of writing a book and getting a message out. Um, and and the reason I tell clients not to do that is because I want you to have a clear end goal. I think in a lot of ways I was lucky in how the book actually, you know, really catapulted both of our businesses in, into a different level. But um, just to back up a little bit, part of what drove me in that book was I saw, I had a lot of friends getting book deals, um, with Wiley in particular, but a lot of friends were getting book deals. And I worked with Wiley for a while, um, back and forth. And initially they told me this idea, you know, was too, like it was a generic real estate book as far as they were concerned. And they didn't think that they needed another generic real estate book. But then we pursued a new idea uh, and they gave me the idea. So I thought, you know, oh, they like me. They want to work with me. This is going to be a book deal. I just, you know, we're just developing the concept. So we actually developed this concept for three months. But in the back of my head the whole time, I kept thinking, I don't want to write this book. Like, I'm not really interested in writing this particular book that they wanted me to write. Um, but it was a book deal. So I was like, I'm getting a book deal. <laughs> so that's really all I cared about. And uh, in the end, they turned me down, saying that they didn't think I would be able to sell enough books for it to be worthwhile for their marketing department to take me on as a client. So I had this, I went back to my original idea, which was really counteracting a lot of the things I saw people doing as a result of these commonly held beliefs, like passive income, like more real estate is better. You know, there's a lot of things that people believed. Um, so I had two things going on and I'll just kind of wrap it up, but I had two things going on. One is that I really, I was like, I'm going to publish a book and I'm going to do it better than you would have done it had you given me a book deal. Mm -hmm. Right. So I kind of had this like vengeance in mind. And then I also really did believe that a lot of people were making huge mistakes um, with the deals that they were doing or even getting into real estate in the first place because they believed a lot of this stuff that was coming out. So I had those two missions and that's all I thought about when I was writing my books. Okay. So, <clears throat> Sorry, where are we in your, your, you have a real estate business, so you are actively and you're making money and the, and the business is going gangbusters, and during this you wrote this book? Um, the businesses were doing okay. So at that time I had two businesses, a training and education company, which was doing okay. Um, it was six figures um, with my husband and I as the two employees, um, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't easy, right? Like things didn't flow. It was all like a constant struggle. Um, and then we had our, our, our investment company, which was going okay, but we were constantly pushing to raise capital at that point. We were buying a house a month, um, so we did have funding coming in, but it was still a constant, like we felt like we were pushing to get the money in. After the book came out, all of that reversed in that you know people filled our courses really quickly. We were selling out about six weeks before any of our programs started, um, and we started to raise our prices on that side. And then on the investment side, people came to us. Um, it was a huge shift for us in both businesses and in that regard. And, and that's when I say it, it, it's never easy, but the flow was there. Like people were flowing to us and the decision making power was in our hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because basically you established yourself as an expert by writing a book as far as as I'm concerned. And so uh, just to, you know, regurgitate what you've been talking about is basically you, you had uh, two successful businesses and you uh, wrote your book, um, and that is more than cash flow, and it is about uh, real estate investment, correct? Yeah. Okay, so, um, well, Julie, we, we have limited amount of time, and I want to actually get into, you have some very interesting uh, videos, and you have so much great advice for authors, so I don't want to do a lot of real estate uh, talk right now, yeah. but um, I just want to have people to understand that you've really, you know, you've been out there, uh, you've done a lot of work, and you have other things going on besides just books, but you are really focused right now on helping people to publish their own books. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's really all I do. Um, I don't, 
I sold off all the real estate training company a couple of years ago to then switch over to running book launchers because when my first book came out, More Than Cash Flow, it, um, I went to number one overall on Amazon in Canada. So I was ahead of Dan Brown, ahead of Game of Thrones series, and that led a lot of my friends that did get book deals with Wiley to go, hey, like, what are you doing? Because our yeah. books aren't doing anywhere near as well as yours is. Yeah, and congratulations <laughs> on that. That is awesome. That's great Thank to hear. You. Yeah, it was good. Like I said, I was on a mission, but I also studied the industry intensely and learned a lot about you know the challenges with traditional publishing, um, the opportunities, but also the challenges with self-publishing. And, and ultimately, you know, that led me to start a company that helps people. It fills in a lot of the gaps that I saw in the marketplace to make sure that you're creating a book that you fully own, you own all the rights, you own all the royalties, um, but also that you're writing a book that is going to achieve your goals, which is why I said I don't actually encourage any of our authors to write a book like I wrote. Um, again, I really feel I was fortunate. I did invest heavily in expert advice along the way, so that might have helped me stay, you know, create a great book that, that did serve multiple purposes. But yeah, we're really focused on not just getting you a book, but getting you a book that's gonna grow your speaking business or grow your training company or grow your consulting business, making sure you write the right book for your goals. And, and that was something I, I saw was really lacking in the marketplace. So yeah, a lot of my tips and stuff that I put out there are all revolving around that. Okay, so just for the, the people that are listening, uh, Julie Broad is the CEO of Book Launchers, and we're not going to talk too much uh, during this interview about Book Launchers because she's promised me I could come back and speak with, uh, I believe it's Jacqueline? Uh, no, it's going to be Sarah Bean, who Sarah? is our book marketing pro. She runs our book marketing for the company. I thought she'd be a great one for you to speak with. Okay, so we'll come back uh, at a later time and we will talk to Sarah about just what uh, Book Launchers uh, has to offer. But let's go back to uh, the new brand you. So um, can you talk about what do you think, is it important for an author to develop a brand? And what kind of brand would an author, author develop? Yeah, I think everybody should have a brand. If you don't, I mean, everybody has a brand. So this is the thing a lot of people don't think about. You have a brand. And if you haven't consciously taken time to develop that brand, then other people are determining what your brand is. So regardless of whether you're an author or not, you need to be consciously creating your brand. Okay, so um, like people, you know, people think I'm like Tom Cruise. So I, I guess that would be my brand, the Tom Cruise lookalike <laughs> guy. Just kidding. But um, so give me an example. So are you going to if I come to book launches and we're not talking about book launchers specifically, um, how can you help me develop my brand? What what can I do? Yeah, it all well, like I said, it all starts off figuring out what makes you a little bit different because you want to be playing on that as often as you possibly can. Uh, because if you're not a little different, then you're just blending in. And, you know, the whole point of a brand is to stand out. So and how do I how do I do that? Yeah, so that's what I was saying earlier about figuring out, you know, what do you say that's a little different than everybody else in your industry? And sometimes it's contrary and sometimes it's something that something that happened to you, you know, whether it was something really good or really bad, it taught you it taught you a lesson. Um, and that's something that makes you a little different. You know, ultimately your story makes you different and who you are and your interests, but you have to think about it from a reader's or an audience perspective. Like, what are they going to care about? Because, you know, the fact that you like to wear purple underwear might make you a little different, but that's not something people are really going to, you know, hang on to and care about. But the fact that you're saying something that, you know, because there's all, everybody, there's always uh, silos in every industry, right? And so, you know, in personal finance, there's people that will agree with, you know, certain approaches. And there's people that will agree with, you know, this approach. And so you want to attract the people that are going to fit into your silo. And there's going to be people who are kind of sitting in the middle and they're going, I fit closely to this one, but nobody's talking about the stuff that I believe over here. So you got to stand out. That's number okay. one. So that's your, you, you say that in um, the new brand, you, um, you talk about when you stand out, uh, you know, people are going to pay attention to you. And sometimes that's not favorable, but you are encouraging people to stand out standalone is that correct yeah for sure you want to stand out i think i think the point that i made in the book was simply to be conscious of the fact that if you are really different um you know for example everybody's in a tox and you show up in bermuda shorts are you standing out in the right way for the brand that you want to create that's all it is you know i'm all for people being totally unique but that has to be who you are and you have to own it 100 percent um so you can't show up in bermuda shorts and not be totally confident and own who you are 
So that's the, you know, so be conscious of that. If you know you're being really different, um, people are going to stare, people are going to talk about you. So you have to own who you are and know that that's you. And, and I think it's great. People who are like that, I love, you know, that's the person I would go talk to at a party. But anyway. <laughs> All right. So do I develop a brand? I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to the question, but on social media, what, what are my concerns about branding on social media? Well, I mean, so for me, the first thing I always tell people is if you hate social media, don't do it. Build your brand elsewhere. Um, but I think, you know, there's a lot of advantages to social media. So I do, I encourage people to try to find one avenue that they like, whether it be LinkedIn or Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. Like I consider YouTube a social media platform. Um, so whatever it is, like find one that you actually like to spend time on and build your brand there. Uh, you don't have to be everywhere. You know, you can be, there's tools that will allow you to post to all these places, but for building a brand, I think it's better to choose an, a place, ideally one that's, you know, your audience is going to be hanging out on, um, you know, as much as possible. Like if you're, if you're targeting the 20 year olds, LinkedIn is probably not where you're going to find them. But, you know, so you have to consider that. But if you really love one of the platforms, you're going to find some of your people there uh, and just be consistent like I already talked about. Okay. So is there a difference between, and, you know, since this is books in hindsight, uh, is there a difference between branding for a nonfiction or a fiction author? Do you, do you, do you think there's a difference? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think because fiction is very genre um, focused. And so your, your brand really has to hone in on finding the people who are, who like your genre. Um, if you're multi-genre, you have challenges and you can see this from some of them. Um, you know, Joanna Penn's a popular podcaster. She's multi-genre and she talks so openly about how she gets tired and it's fatiguing to have multiple pen names and multiple brands, but she separates it by having multiple pen names so that she can build brands for each of these pen names. So just to build multiple brands. So yes, it matters because your audience for each genre and each kind of that is going to be different and what they're doing is different. Fiction is entertainment. Nonfiction is usually solving a problem or inspiring or something around that. There's an element of entertainment. I always think you want to entertain while you're helping, but you know, the reality is that fiction and nonfiction, there's two totally different purposes. So your brands are going to be two totally different angles. Okay. Well, all right. That's great. Um, and then I just want to uh, just go over very quickly the, so that people have a little insight into uh, Julie's book that she really talks about branding and she talks about um, basically salesmanship, right? And um, you talk about what's your idea. And can you, can you elaborate? I mean, I don't want you to give the book away, but um, what's, what's your idea? Is, is that something that this is something that not necessarily with books, but just uh, an idea to make money? Is that what we're talking about? I or a boot? Yeah, about. <laughs> I think it's kind of, you know, really what I've already touched on a couple of times, which is figuring out what makes you different. Um, okay. You know, Okay, well, I don't. People, yeah. I don't want you to have to keep going over this stuff. Okay, Julie. So, um, you talk about a soft sell. What yeah. is? It? Tell us what what a soft sell is. Yeah, I mean, a soft sell is where you're not really selling. Like it's you're telling people. I mean, I do this all the time. So, booklaunchers.tv is my YouTube channel, and you can kind of see this is it's all a soft sell. You know, I'm I'm providing content and basically showing you how to do it without hiring my company. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'll say, hey, listen, you know, if you want someone else to do this, booklaunchers uh, booklaunchers.com, we can help. And then I carry on with the tips. So to me, that's really a soft sell. I'm inviting you to learn more, to contact me. To really put again, I want to have the control in my hands. Uh, I want to be the one making the decision whether you're the right fit for me or not. So I don't really want to be hard selling. I want to be kind of inviting you to learn more. And if you like what you see, you contact me, and then we discuss if, if we're a good fit to work together. Yeah, and Julie makes a great. Uh, she had a great example in there. Somebody I think was working on her house or something, and just basically started asking her questions and 
uh, he went from just a small job to a, a few thousand dollar job just by identifying the needs that she had. So, uh, yeah, that's just it's it's really a great book, Julie, and uh, I enjoyed reading it. And it's very informative. But let's go back to the the mechanics and the process. Um, we you had a one book out. You had more than cash flow out. So, what made you want to write the new brand you? Um, two things. One is that a lot of our real estate clients, our, um, the training clients, they were evolving. So they weren't asking us questions about you know, how to choose a house. It now became, okay, I've bought five houses. I need more money. How do I raise that money? Um, I've bought you know, 20 houses and now people are asking me how to do it. How do I build a course? How do I track people? So it really evolved from there naturally. And I found that a lot of the people that I was that were in our mastermind groups were really trying to you know go to that next level, and and that was brand building. You know that was not I know how to calculate whether a house is going to cash flow anymore. That was really figuring out how you're going to be known to the world and and put it out there. So it was a combination of that. Plus, at the same time, I was looking to leave real estate behind a little bit. Um, you know, after 15 years in that business uh, full time and living with someone who was doing the business full time too. So this was, you know, it was basically day and night was real estate in my house. Um, I was really looking to talk about something new. So the book was a good catalyst for me to start speaking and doing more training and coaching around that subject. So that was kind of, it was twofold. Okay. So what is your, uh, you have have had, uh, you have uh, made some very interesting points on some of your videos. And if you haven't seen any of Julie's videos on YouTube, uh, just go to Julie Broad or, or go to Book Launchers and you will see some very interesting and informative videos. Uh, Julie, you made a great point at one time about how self-publishing is so much of a better deal than going the traditional route. Mm-hmm. And could you talk uh, a little bit about that? And before you do, I just want to, you know, you talked about your first book and they were real excited about it. And then they turned you down. How did that, I, I know, I know how it made you feel, but you really wanted to show them, right? You really wanted to, to kind of, you know, teach them a lesson about don't mess with Julie Broad, right? Well, not, I mean, it wasn't even teaching them a lesson. It was proving to myself because part of what happened when I was rejected, and again, it wasn't even just a rejection. It was they worked with me closely for three months on a book proposal. And then they said, you know what? The marketing department's decided you can't sell enough books for it to matter, really. Uh, so it wasn't even rejecting my idea. They rejected me. So that it, it was a kick. And it was all, I was also of this mindset that I felt like I needed somebody to approve my book idea in order to write it. Like I, and, I, and so there was two things that went on. Like my ego was badly crushed. Again, I had friends that got book deals that I looked at what they were doing and thought, you know, I could sell as many books or more than they can. So yeah, there was a lot going on. So there was kind of more I had to prove to myself than anyone uh, that I didn't need somebody else to say my book idea was good and that I didn't need someone else to you know ride on their shoulders to sell books. Um, and, and I'm really glad, I'm really, really glad because a couple things have happened since then that showed me um, self-publishing is far superior. Because again, I felt like I had to do it, I had no other choice. So, uh, but looking back, I'm glad that it happened and I wouldn't take a traditional deal right now. Um, it would have to be an extremely favorable deal. So one of my friends who did get a deal around the same time, HGTV approached him and wanted to do a TV series based on his book. And uh, he could not get the rights sorted out uh, to be able to sign the deal. He ended up having to go back to the publisher and buy his book back from the publisher in order to sign the deal with HGTV. So he signed the deal, he bought the book back, which I don't know how much that cost, that was never disclosed, Um, but he signed the deal with HGTV, he flew down to Florida, they shot a pilot, and then the book, or then the TV show didn't get picked up. So if he'd had the rights in the first place, (laughs) he could have saved himself a whole lot of money and hassle. Uh, And then another one of my friends who got a book deal, again, around the same time, he wrote it with two co-authors. And uh, and then a couple years later, he left the real estate industry just like I did. And the publisher kind of went, oh, you're not in real estate anymore and you're not promoting this book anymore. Oh, okay. They republished it under somebody else's name. They didn't give any credit to his two co-authors, let alone him. And it was, other than a changed foreword or changed introduction, it was word for word his book, 100%. It was just a new title. Yeah. 
So these things, and they, it's gross, but they are 100% within their rights to do it because they own it. Mm -hmm. And so they own the rights and they can limit what you can do internationally, audiobook. They can own the audiobook rights and then never produce an audiobook. There's so many things that the publisher controls that you lose control on. And I don't think a lot of authors realize it. And a lot of authors think, if I just get a deal, they'll do the marketing. Guess what? The reason my book was turned down was because they didn't think I'd be able to sell enough books. They did, it's not them. They're going, oh, she's not going to sell enough books. It has nothing to do with them. They get your book into bookstores and then you have to do the rest. And then for all of the work that gets on your shoulders, you get paid like 15 cents or 15%, I should say, for, you know, they're taking 85% and you get 15% of the profits for giving them all your expertise and then doing all the work to promote it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a, uh, almost a scam. I just have to tell you, I was interviewing um, another author. He does web, uh, they have web hosting. He has his own company as well. And they told him he didn't have enough Twitter followers. So, and he has just a great idea. It was a great book. And um, they told him he didn't have enough Twitter, Twitter followers. So, I mean, I know there's so many stories that people can tell about these people that filter out books from the, the publishing industry, industry, and we can all be thankful for Amazon. So let's talk about um, your success. Uh, do you feel like um, it was worth it I, to, to uh, publish? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm not. I, uh, let's, well, you can talk about financially if you want. What about uh, spiritually and, and uh, for your ego? How, how, how was that? Yeah, no, it, in, in all aspects, it was phenomenal. Uh, I'm so glad I did it. And, you know, it was, it was painful. It was definitely, there was times where I'm going, why am I doing this to myself? And I put money into it that I didn't really know if I should be. Like it was, not that I ha didn't have the money, but it's money that I felt could be allocated elsewhere where I could, I knew I could get a return. So I had a lot of fears around it. Um, plus it's always playing in the back of my head. You know, they don't think you can sell books. They don't think you can sell books, right? So I was worried. Um, so for me, it was, it was that piece I needed to go, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna, what, I can set my mind to something and torture myself to get it done right and do really well at it. And, and that was really, really good. But financially, yeah, it paid off so, so lucratively for me. Um, and I've seen it pay off for a lot of other people too. Again, it's not every book though. So you have to write the right book for the right audience. And still, sometimes some are gonna go flat. My second book didn't do as well. I didn't promote it very hard. I was pregnant and super sick. Uh, so I really didn't put a lot of juice behind it. Uh, and then I switched gears and decided to open book launchers. But, you know, it still did okay, but it didn't, you know, it didn't fly like the first one did. And I think that you have to know that some are going to do really well and some some may not do as well as you hope, but there's still going to be things that come out of it. Uh, and, you know, even my second book, there's still lots of benefits from it that I can point to. So, yeah, I love it. I, I'm so that's why I started book launchers. I'm so excited about what books can do for you um, and the aspects that in your life it'll benefit. And a side note, um, you know, it can change relationships, too, you know, because I, I can say it because I know my mother in law will probably not listen to your podcast. I don't even think she knows what podcasts are. Um, she, my relationship with her changed for the better too. And I don't know if it's because she read the book and got to know me better, or she just was so impressed that I actually wrote a book. I don't know why the dynamic changed, but it did change as a result of putting a book out. So you never know what, what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. So tell us about the financial side of it. You've talked a little bit about yeah. in your videos, but can, and I, I said uh, before I, I've been talking to you and I said, you made 300,000 and you pointed out that was not correct. No. So what, what was your what was your financial what was your bottom line there? Yeah, I mean I haven't done the math in a little while, but I know I had made over over a hundred thousand dollars in book sales, like actual profit in my pocket from the sale of books. Um, that's over four and a, I think that was after four and a bit years, but you know still it was I was pretty thrilled with that. And uh, and in our businesses, like I said, our the six figure training and education company, it wasn't the only thing I did. Like the book led to a lot of speaking, so it's hard to say the book did it all but the book opened up media and speaking and all these kind of things and then our business doubled in the next uh, 12 months after the book came out so the book was a catalyst for all of that stuff to happen and then our investment business we actually ended up having so much capital coming in that we moved from buying houses into buying commercial properties so yeah financially it's hard to say exactly because it's not a direct like the book did this but the book led to and the book was the turning point my, my husband calls the first book the game changer because he's like everything in our businesses shifted when that book came out i would call it a catalyst 
Yeah, that's what I, mean, I just said. So, it was like the catalyst. But the, he calls it the game changer. So. And, and speaking of catalyst, let's go back to my... Um, when we're talking about um, your brand, did the book uh, reinforce your brand? Yes. Or I should have said the books. Um, yeah, for sure. They, they both reinforced my brands. For... Would you recommend? Would you recommend? Because like I said, I'd interviewed... Um, a guy who has a web hosting, very successful web hosting company, and um, the book seemed to enhance his business. Would you recommend writing a book if you have your own business? <laughs> yeah, I think every business owner should probably write a book um, because it it reinforces your company's brand as much as your brand, and it really it also shortens the sales process. So no matter what business you're in. It will educate people so that you don't have to answer a lot of the common questions that you spend time answering. Like I said, people literally called us up that we did not know. It felt like a scam at first. We're like, what's wrong? Like something's wrong. Because people would call us up and they would say, we have $250,000. We'd like to invest it with you. And we would go, um, sorry, who are you? Like, you know, and, and it felt really weird because people knew all about us. And, and that's so it really shortens the sales cycle. So I think every business can benefit from it. And I've seen this, you know, we have people, we have authors that are selling like CBD oil. We have authors who are speakers. We have authors who are selling um, like kind of like widget type project products, but they all benefit from having the story behind their book, the st or story behind their business, the story behind the, you know their life and why they created this business. Um, and then explaining, you know, how to put these products or services into use and what happens when you do. Okay. Don't you feel like this is an exam? You know, I used to teach and so I'd, I'd give these oral exams and this is kind of the same thing. So I just feel like, oh, I have a student here and she's passing all my, passing all my questions. I better give her something <laughs> harder. Okay. So Julie, what's the, what's the future hold? I don't know if you've mentioned, I don't think you've mentioned any future project projects with books. You have any more books on the, in the, in the, what is the hamper? Is that what they say? Hopper maybe? Yeah. Oh. Hopper, that's what it is. Yeah. Yes. Any more books? Uh, yeah, of course. I think I'm, I'm always going to be working on a book. I've got a new book uh, that I'm working on around book launchers, um, so around what we do to help people self-publish and succeed with self-publishing. Uh, it'll be out in late 2019, I think. Um, there's two two things I've, I'm really focused on with this book. One is that I want it to illustrate what we do, so I don't want it to. I don't want to rush it, which is something I'm always telling my clients. Like self-publishing, you can put a book out faster than ever, but to do it right, you know, you really want to think it through and, and do it right. So I really want to illustrate it with that. But I also want to include a lot of case studies and stories from our clients. And there's some books that are going to be launching in the next three to three or four months that I want to include because I can see what's coming down the, the pipe for them. And I really want to make sure they get included. So I'm kind of dragging my feet on the book just to make sure I can include those folks. <laughs> All right. So if I'm an author and if I'm a guy like Matthew Hines, who does everything himself, uh, what kind of a advice would you tell me if you if you said if I said I don't need your I don't need book launchers because um, I'm an English teacher I know how to write a paragraph I know how to edit stuff so what would you say to me yeah sure you can put a book out you know let me know how it goes <laughs> <laughs> is that right you you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't recommend anything or do you think that's a good idea now because you spent I believe you said you spent three thousand to put out that I'm never right on my figures, am I? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. How much did you spend to put out um, your second book? My second book, I spent uh, 8500 Yeah. Oh, boy. Okay. But your return on it was 100000 or close to 100000 My first, My first book was 100000 in okay. sales. The second book, I haven't done the math on it. Like I said, it didn't do that well. I, I definitely got the money back, but that's probably in direct book sales. That's, I got the money back, but that's probably about it. Um, but it, I got paid for several speaking engagements that came directly from the book, wow. and that you know that more than paid for the book right there. Um, okay. So, so yeah. Okay, so um, what I'm trying to to nail down here is, um, if I in the in the publishing world today, and um, I published my first book in 2005, mm -hmm. and I I actually didn't self publish. I paid somebody to. A Canadian company, by the way, out of uh, Vancouver. I'm in Seattle. I didn't know if you knew that. 
But yep. uh, so so we have the um, interactions with you with Canadians all the time. Yeah. But things have changed so much since 2005 in the publishing world where if I wanted to publish in 2005, that I would have just dealt with uh, getting a book out and there was limited marketing that you could do. There wasn't that much social media or um well, there's just so many issues now that you have to deal with, like having a web page, um, being on Twitter, uh, what you're talking about, branding. And so am I crazy to just go out and do it by myself? I So to answer your earlier question of what I would say to you, it, was, it would depend because there's some people who just are adamant that they're going to do it all themselves. So I'm not going to waste my time trying to argue with you. Um, but there's some people who just don't know that there's there's problems with that approach. So even if you are an English teacher, you're still not the best person to edit your work. The reality is it's your work, you're too close to it. And so you're not gonna be able to see all the issues with it. And you're an English teacher, you're not a trained professional editor. Um, so a professional editor, and we actually put every book through three different editors because everybody has different skill sets, which should right there tell you something that no one person actually has the skill sets to be all three things plus the writer. So. Um, yeah, so I would explain these things to you that, you know, it's not a good idea to edit your own work regardless of your expertise. It might be, your manuscript might be in a heck of a lot better shape than the vast majority of people, which just means it'll go faster. But it doesn't mean that you don't need those people. The other thing is, if you're an English teacher, you're probably not the same person who should design your cover because your skill sets are going to be very dramatically different. Um, and so you're you're going to absolutely want a professional cover designer um, and layout. There's templates and you can do layout yourself nowadays, but I see problems with layouts all the time. And I just know that it's somebody who didn't spend the money to get it professionally laid out, especially if you go to, if you have print and different e versions. Cause in fact, iBooks requires a different for or it's books. Now Apple books, um, it requires a different version than Kindle. Like there's issues with different formats. So just get it professionally laid out. And again, if you want to do it yourself, that's great, but it's probably going to take you six to eight weeks to do it yourself because it's pain. It's a painful process. It's kind of an ugly job. <laughs> I've got five books. I, I know how ugly it is. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, what's the cost? I mean, if I was going to get the full and I, I don't want to, I mean, I know there's other companies out there and whatever. Yeah. So you've all got um, different pricing and whatever, but a, a ballpark figure, you said 8,000 when you did your first book and that's not a very big book so i mean it's like i i might are yours are yours is like 200 pages or something Sorry, mine are 500 page monstrosities so yeah. that would get quite expensive so how much like for a medium-sized book would would book launchers um can you give me a ballpark figure we're membership based so it really depends on like the size of your book greatly impacts how long it'll take for sure so as long as you're a member, we just keep working on your book and it's one professional at a time. So, you know, when the writing coach is done working with you on the writing side, then it moves into the um, content edit, into the, into the copy edit, proofread, cover, so on. So it's very sequential. Then we get to our marketing team. Um, and as long as you stay a member, then we just keep pitching your book and pitching you. Um, we're looking for bulk opportunities and, you know, library, distribute, you know, we kind of look at anywhere that we can get your book into in front of as many people as possible. So as long as you're a member, then we just keep working on it. So for me to say a cost is really hard because it's, you can actually stay with us as forever, really. And we have multiple authors who are actually wrapping up book one and they're continuing on with book two. So, <laughs> so it's hard, but ballpark, most people, um, if you come to us with an idea uh, and you need to be coached through it or have one of our writers work on it, you're looking at nine to 15 months. If you come to us with a finished first draft of a manuscript, you're depending on the quality of that first draft, um, you're probably going to end up being somewhere between six to 12 months working with us. Um, okay. but, but again, our clients actually aren't leaving. Like they're getting to the marketing phase and then they're staying with us. So it's hard to say at what point people will leave because if you're getting value and it's growing your business and building your brand and getting your book out there, you know, it's, it's hard to leave that. <laughs> yeah. So are you, you're almost sounding like a literary agency. So do you do any, I mean, if I come to you and I'm a poor starving author, will you, will you do a profit sharing thing with me or none of that? Do you ever turn people away? Do you say you, <laughs> okay, I guess there's uh, no question about that. So, um, why would I, why would you turn somebody away? 
Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, to answer the first part of your question, one of the reasons I started the company was because I wanted to make sure that you had 100% control and ownership of your book and get all rights and royalties. So this is indie publishing, you know, you own everything. So that's really, really important to me. I'm almost anal to a fault on that. Like, you know, you, you buy your own ISBN number for the sole reason that I want you to be the name on record for that, not my company. Um, the second part of it is I turn people away who I don't think we're going to be able to create a great success story because I'm not just in the business of helping you create a great book. I'm in the business of creating success stories from your book. And if you come to me either the most commonly turn the, the spot I turn most people away is when you come to me with a finished book and you say help me market this and uh, and I just you know most people not most but a big chunk of people come to me with finished books that either aren't selling for a reason or they haven't planned it out to be something that will actually achieve their goals um, the other challenge is when somebody has a finished book that it has nothing to do with their business and you know I had one guy actually who he is in a completely different industry wrote a book on um, fertility issues and he wants to promote that book under a pen name and he's not willing to be at all the face um, so he has no platform he won't utilize any friends or family like you know there's nobody in his sphere of influence that can know that he wrote this book um, and and I just looked at the math and I thought like this is going to be a real challenge for us to create a very happy customer um, you know, not that I didn't think we could help him, but I didn't think the numbers were going to work for it to be like this. I got a great return on my time and investment in this project. So, you know, he and I have talked several times and I've just, I ultimately, I said, look, like I'd love to help you, but I just don't think it's going to make sense because the only way you're making your money back in this scenario is from book sales and you're going to have to sell a ton of books, which is going to be challenging. Um, and he's also in Canada, so you can't even run Amazon ads. Um, so, uh, so it's it, you know eventually they'll probably change that. But you know, it's that bad up there. Oh it's my! Not bad. It's just a different. Amazon is different, and that's something a lot of people don't realize. Amazon in Canada is not Amazon.com. Right. It's Amazon.ca. It, it's Amazon. You know, UK, UK. And UK, and it's it's and they're different entities, yeah. and they don't communicate like one company. There's cross border issues, and um, yeah. they function differently. Okay, well, that's great. So, Julie, we're almost out of time here, and this is so informative. I want to ask you who, I, I mean, look, before we get out of the realm of this, uh, I just want to bring it back uh, to people's attention. Uh, the book is The New Brand You, Your New, Your New Image uh, Makes the Sale for You. Julie's first book was More Than Cash Flow, and uh, she can be found at booklaunchers.com. And is it juliebroad.com? Yep. Okay. So you can find Julie's books there. And also I am selling them through affiliate links on hindsight.com uh, if you want to look for her books there. So Julie, you have, I've talked to a couple of book uh, people who do what you do, um, yep. what your company does, and you have a very unique model because most people just steer you into a, a um, editor or a um, cover designer, whatever. But you seem to be uh, covering the whole the whole publishing thing, and we're going to talk about that more when we interview. Is it Sarah? You said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll just um, we'll, we'll hold off on that. But I want to know: Is this your idea? Is Book Launchers? You thought of all this? Yeah, yeah, it's my company because. And the big thing. So I'll just touch on that membership model really quickly. The reason I went with that is because. I didn't want, first of all, I wanted a holistic approach. I don't want anybody to just be editing, just be designing a cover. I want everybody to be thinking about, okay, what's success for this author? What's the goal? And how are we going to help create it at every step of the process? Because there's lots of little things you can do at every stage that will help your book achieve that ultimate goal. Um, but also, I didn't like how some companies were like, okay, pay us $20,000 and we'll do everything for you. Um, and I felt like that that model makes me uncomfortable. I would be uncomfortable putting out that kind of cash up front. My model is you can cancel at any time. And so the onus is on us to make you happy. And so we work really hard and I've hired people who you know care enormously about every single person we work with. Um, and so that's why I kind of dreamed up this model. I was like, what do I think 
people answer all the challenges that I saw. I was, I mean, there's there's challenges on my side um, from from managing this on a cost perspective because there's months where it costs me far more than people are paying me, um, especially on editing. Like you say, if you send me a hundred thousand word book, it's costing me sometimes two and a half times the monthly membership cost to edit that book. So there's challenges on my side. It's not a perfect system, um, but you know, they're, they're, I love this model, so I'm gonna keep working with it to find a way to make it profitable for me and, and our authors all love it, so. Well, we're gonna share this podcast all over the place. So you're gonna, gonna be making all the money you ever wanted. <laughs> well, Julie, I, it's such an honor to have you on uh, Books in Hindsight, and um, I can't wait to talk to Sarah, yeah. and hopefully we can do that uh, soon enough. Because you, it's such an interesting um, concept you have for, for book launchers. And if you haven't watched Julie on YouTube, you got to go. You got to see some of her uh, videos, especially if you are an aspiring author. She really has a lot of great information for you. And um, how many videos do you have out, Julie? You must have like 100 at least. I would say so. I put out one every single week. Yeah. Um, in 2019, I'm going to do two a week. So. Um, so it'll be 104 more in yep. 2019. Yeah. <laughs> and they're very well edited and they're pretty fun to watch. So Thank you. pretty great. All right, Julie Broadwell, I really do appreciate your time and please tell Sarah to come, uh, and do an interview with us as soon as possible. Yeah. And I wish you all the luck in the world. It's just great talking to you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Well, I'm going to say bye to everybody. So if you're watching this or listening on iTunes, uh, this is Matthew Hines for Books in Hindsight with Julie Broad, and please keep on reading. This has been Books in Hindsight with your host, Matthew Hines. Please join us for our next podcast and look for our archives on iTunes and go to thehindsight.com. That's H-E-I-N-E-S site.com for great books by Matthew Hines and other great authors.